Um, thank you. It wasn't that high a step. Um, so thank you very much. It's, it's really my honor to be here with you today. Um, it's, it's really my hope that um, for your troubles, I deliver some real value. Uh, in particular, uh, really being an evangelist or encouraging you to think about speech perception and perception more broadly in a way that has not been typical in our field this far. There we go. Um, in, so all of us, you can all hear me, right? I lecture to halls this large all the time. Um, so we all work together to try to solve problems, to do the right kinds of experiments. Um, and I've seen some beautiful experiments being conducted here today. But sometimes science is fortunate to advance in another way. And that's rather than solving problems by running new experiments, it's adopting a new perspective. And within that perspective, things that we saw as problems in our old perspective now dissolve. Or they, uh, they're not so much solved, but the term is dissolved. So for example, um, if one's problem is finding the right fencing to corral your unicorn, then there's really no problem at all because this problem has been dissolved upon finding that unicorns, in fact, don't exist. So what I've found in the last 20 years or so is by adopting an information theoretic perspective that I'll introduce to you today, a lot of the classic problems for speech perceptions, the ones that have dogged us since the invention of the pattern playback, actually become dissolved upon just taking a different tack on the problem. Uh, the basic scope of the presentation is I've got to set up a little bit of background uh, about objects versus objectives for perception. And these were really the thorny issues that brought me to adopt Shannon information theory as my framework. Uh, and then I'll be applying these principles within this framework to problems like rate normalization, spectral contrast, uh, in terms of uh, helping us with score articulation, uh, redundancy of speech and covariance and talker normalization, and then end with the general models, the general kind of learning models. Uh, some of these are actually machine learning algorithms, but the class of models that I'd be encouraging us to think about. Um, and these really do have application to things like, for example, an infant learning to talk. Uh, so the first point that I just want to make is really a rather, it's, it's actually not bold among perception people, it's been around for a very long time. But we often think about perception as this act where we gain information about the world and construct something inside our head. And that thing inside our head is supposed to be some rendition of reality. And that would be the idea of objects of perception. Uh, that's not true. It's also not possible. Uh, what is possible is an objective for perception, and that our perceptual systems are well suited to guide adaptive action. The only organisms that move are the organisms that have sensory systems. So I hope you all recognize this little guy as a Venus flytrap. I'll give you my personal favorite example. Uh, all of you, I'm sure, are um, familiar with ascidian sea squirts. Sea squirts are one of the first chordates. This is this little larva, and he's actually got a little eye spot, a little balance, uh, otolith, and he swims around to find out where he's going to spend the rest of his life as a siphon of water. So here's his order of business. Swim around to find a hard surface where you're going to spend the rest of your life. Second order of business, digest your entire tail and nervous system within minutes. In other words, your sensory system is no longer relevant if you are not on the move. Now, getting back to the first point where I said you cannot know what the world is, I did not think of this. Uh, you might first come across it in Plato's Allegory of the Cave. 
Uh, for some of you who waited a little bit longer, 1999, The Matrix is, in fact, the scheme play is written as the science fiction version of Plato's Allegory of the Cave. Why don't we know? Why can't we know what's in the world? It's something called the inverse problem. And the inverse problem, here shown in provision by Bishop George Barclay in the early 18th century, is simply the problem that for any two-dimensional array on your retina, there's an infinite number of three-dimensional worlds that give rise to precisely the same retinal arrays. You can imagine that for a waveform impinging on your ears, the problem gets no better. In fact, it might get a little bit of worse. For any given waveform, there's actually an infinite number of sound producing devices that could give rise to precisely the same sound arriving on your phone. All right, so recovering the world, even if we like it, the idea of it, even if we think it would be very attractive for us, it's unfortunately impossible. All right, so this is one of the things that drew me to Shannon information. Uh, Claude Shannon, one of the most famous engineers of the 20th century, was at Bell Labs in the 50s working on telephones. And he had to try to find a way to describe information transmission, channel capacity, which they didn't have that much over copper wires back then. And his brilliant insight was that information didn't, wasn't something that was in a transmitter and I'm going to put into the receiver, but instead he found a way to formalize and calculate information as the relationship between a transmitter and a receiver. Much like you have a relationship with the world, even though the world doesn't get to come into your head. All right, so this isn't some squishy idea. This is communication technology. Every one of you is holding a device that is designed around Shannon information theory. All right, it remains. All right, so, it's the real, so we want to think about information as the relationship between you and your world. The way Shannon characterized this is really the vernacular for you. Information is something you don't already know. All right, if you know it, if it's already there, it's not information. So if you get your head around this, what this means is when something is very predictable, there is no information. And if we got out to something like white noise, where nothing's predictable, that actually has the most potential information. So there's no information in anything that stays the same or in anything we already know. So to give you an idea of information, this is I don't know, it's just so fun. This is still my old recycling schedule. They used to send this to us on paper. It looks like a lot of information, doesn't it? Well, it turns out that our day was Wednesday and that they only did recycling every other week. So this entire diagram is 3.8 total bits of information. Which of the seven days a week? And I had to know that I alternate weeks for recycling. All right, so there's much less information, and I'll come back to this uh, as we go along. So this is really to emphasize that idea. This has the most potential information. It is white noise. This, a scene from a Korean countryside, you see is much, has much less actual potential information. And the, realize, the reason is it's richly structured. And what structure means is it's actually very redundant. Now, I'm not the first to stumble across this. Uh, the first real evangelist for information theory and psychology was Fred Atnave, a visual vision scientist. Uh, but I think this is a really pithy quote, is that when we begin to consider perception as an information handling process, it quickly becomes clear that much of the information received by a higher organism is redundant. The preceding statement, taken in its broadest implications, is precisely equivalent to an assertion that the, the world as we know it is lawful. And perception is an act of exploiting its lawfulness to be as sensible as, as sensitive as possible to those things that aren't predictable. 
because the things that aren't predictable are what information is. So information at its heart is change. So there's a lot of things in the world that stay the same from place to place and time to time, but there's no information in that. Information instead is always defined by change, and change by definition always requires something from which to change. By the way, for any engineering fans, this is what delta coding is. This is how your cell phone works. All right, so kind of one of the reasons I really like this idea is that it's changed from some context. And that can be either your current experience or your past experiences with the environment and learning. So I think about the auditory system. You know what the entire past experience of a single eighth nerve fiber in your, audit uh, fiber in your auditory nerve, the last 35 or 50 milliseconds or so. That's its work. But if I go up a little more and through the auditory system, I see things that wait and gather information over the span of 50 or 100 milliseconds, and instead of that single channel, across lots of channels. Right, so you see the context and the time grows. And so this, when I, was, when I teach, there's always this hard question that a student asks, like, what's the difference between sensation and what's perception and what's perceptual learning? <laughs> Like, where do I draw a line? And the beauty of this information theoretic approach is there is no line. There's a continuous ratcheting of a sophistication with which you're going to extract predictability in that input. All right, now, we want to make this real. So, back a couple slides, or maybe it's on this slide. Oh, here it is. Is that Here's, oh, just this idea of change. So delta coding, I don't want to go beyond, yeah, skip over this. Del delta coding is the way all sensory systems work. All right, your ears, your eyes, your taste, none of it encodes anything in absolute terms. It's all in changes that are occurring in the system. And this is a really good thing. Consider your auditory system. Your auditory system has a bandwidth about this big. So does your visual system. The, and by the way, the ears are great. I mean, for, dis, for middle ear bones descending from gill arches, this is a pretty rocking system. But actual loudness levels in the world span this much. So what biological systems do is they're always moving your biological dynamic range up and down to be in the place where there's flux in the world. So if you walk out into bright sunshine and at first it seems really bright and it's hard to tell things apart, your eyes adjust and they bring your dynamic range up there. You walk into a dark place or a theater, at first you're blind, and the whole system adjusts to look at energy fluxes down there. So this is all about change. And it's this is called adaptation, and this is a ubiquitous mechanism in all of perception. And there's many more additional mechanisms that enhance our responsiveness to change as we ascend through the system. Now, one of the things we don't do is I don't want you to think that we maximize the amount of information we can get in. Right? Go out there and go to the last little bit of information. That'd be really, really wasteful. Instead, biological information processing systems are actually pretty smart in that they look for information relative to where information is in the world. So in this example, for sounds, one of the true universals in the universe as it happens is 1 over f naught. is that there is much more power at the lower frequencies and it continues to decrease about six decibels dB per octave as we go to higher frequencies. And this is true natural, for if we decompose natural images, network traffic, fluid dynamics, quasars, or most important, this is true for speech. So the way I want us to think about information is really the biologically sensible place 
between chasing out to the last predictable bit, but calibrating that to what's actually in the world. So when I talk about information, I don't talk about maximizing it. I talk about optimizing it, having an optimal dynamic range for information. Um, it turns out, this is also something you happen to be carrying your phones. So finding that opti uh, optimal dynamic range, capturing most but not everything, is in an, a JPEG, an MP3, or an MP4. All those compression algorithms basically operate on this principle. Something I'll touch on briefly today, and talk mostly tomorrow, is in a higher dimensional space how we organize that space in a way to optimize information transmission. All right, so let's put this to work, see if it does anything for us. So here's the classic problem of rate normalization, medium rate speech, fast rate speech, slow rate speech. And people worked a lot on rate normalization. Um, here's our tag on it. What we did is we took sentences and we did a pretty extreme temporal distortion. In the first case, every 20 milliseconds of the signal was flipped backward. Then the next 20 milliseconds was flipped backwards. Or 40 milliseconds. Or 80 milliseconds. Or 160 milliseconds. This is a pretty severe distortion. And I know you want to hear what it sounds like. <laughs> That's a hundred, every 160 milliseconds is split. I actually find it amazing you're this good. The puppy played with the ball. 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 All right, so that's the way we did the experiment. And the idea of this was to get a sense of the relationship between information versus time in fluent speech. These are the data for fast, medium, and slow sentences. And all this makes perfect sense to you. Everyone can already predict. Boy, I bet if it's fast, as soon as I get out here to these 20 millisecond flips, it's going to start going down by 40, and here I crash at 80 millisecond flips. I, here's medium rate speech, doing pretty well until with the 40s, kind of hanging on with 80, and then I crash at 160 then slow it down a little bit. And it's remarkable that even though every 80 milliseconds is being flipped backward in slow speech, you're still, an, um, you're still over 80% correct. So what we wanted to see is what does, how does this relate to actually what's happening in the signal. So forget about consonants and vowels for now, and just imagine that I cut this up in a bunch of spectral slices. And what I want to do is find how similar they are to the slice 10 milliseconds away. Well, actually, it was 16. 16, 32, 48, 64, 70 milliseconds. And what you see is that when we look at distance differences, spectral differences across spectral slices, Uh, oh, I skipped, uh, I'll get to that. Let me, I, I'm, my apologies. This is what happens if you take those data and map, these are still the human data, and map them on the proportion of the utterance instead of time. So if I take these data and I say what proportion of the utterance was flipped, and now you see they all fall on the set. So the point is that information per unit time changes with rate, but intelligibility is pr predicted by the proportion of the information. It's not predicted by time. Uh, and then now the inquiring mind wants to know, well, what's happening? And this is the thing I started to describe one slide too soon, which is where we find the greatest differences between adjacent spectral slices. It turns out for all of the sentences, they get hard. Um, what we do is we see a maximum here, a maximum difference between spectral slices when we get out to about 0.1 proportion of the utterance traversed. 
What's interesting is this is a maximum difference, and then this bumps up to be the mean difference between any two spectral slices you pull out of an entire corpus of speech. But when you're one tenth of the utterance away, that's actually the optimally distinct part. And where that roughly maps onto, for at least English, oh, so first, much of the performance can be predicted by only the amount of relative potential information available in spectral change, R.92. In this case, this spectral change corresponds to the structure of spoken English. So it's really, what it is, is it starts to change about the time we get to the set, the, the minima roughly corresponds to the midpoints of syllables, which is the way English works, is that the onset is more or less independent from the offset, as in bet, but, boot, bot, beat, but, beat, bit, bat. Is that so performance minima are roughly when we get to the midpoint of the system. The takeaway from this is that when we recapture this as talking about information, relative amount of change in a signal, it effectively gives us automatic rate normalization. So the real answer to our problem is that for speech, once we've captured characterized information right, it's not all that different from this being medium size, this one small, and this one larger, and no one of those has more information than any of the others. All right. Now, I'm going to try to get this to do a little bit of work for us, this amount of spectral change. So there's been a lot of studies of what are the best predictors of speech intelligibility? Are they vowels? Are they consonants? Is it duration? And we asked, Christian Stope and I, maybe relative information may be the relative psychoacoustic change irrespective of consonants and vowels. And we introduced this idea of hopefully a scaled entropy. And while this chart might be a little tough, uh, it's actually a super simple idea. For every one millimeter along your cochlea, in other words, roughly the same number of neurons, we create a filter. And so there's a filter for every one millimeter, and basically about one per equal rectangular bandwidth. And we pass our signal through those filters. Here's our bank of filters. And we get these per rate filters. Then what we do is we take a box car where we just look how much change is within about 80 milliseconds, which is about the average duration of a consonant in the Tinnit database, or 112 milliseconds duration. We just kind of convolve it across. So this is basically the experiment. And the experiment is how much can I predict how well you perceive speech with a simple measure of how much your cochlea is wiggling. So the stimuli were something like this. This is the variation in cochlea scaled entropy. You see that there are these peaks where lots of stuff is changing. There are these places where not a whole heck of a lot is changing. So we'll take out the high ones. Take out chunks where there's high entropy, and you can listen to that. What did you mean by that Russell egg? And everyone understood that correctly? <coughs> All right, not? All right. And that's the intact sentence up there. Now what I'm going to do is instead take out parts where the cochlea is not doing a lot of wiggling. I don't know if those are constants or vowels. I just know it's a place where the cochlea is not doing a lot, changing a lot. <coughs> What did you mean by that rattlesnake gag? Better? What did you mean by that rattlesnake gag? Same amount of sound taken out in both cases. I don't know what a consonant or a vowel is, but I do know whether your cochlea wiggled a lot or a little. And we're able to predict intelligibility really quite well, whether we're taking out regions of low, low change, medium change, or high change. All right. So it's starting to do a little work for us. Now, uh, let's see. I want to make sure I stay on top. Um, just basically, I'm going to talk a little bit about contrast because you see contrast all the time. All right, so you know that I'm showing you this slide 
because the grayscale right there is identical to the grayscale there. And you go, ooh, doesn't that one look darker? Well, the reason is, is that everything is delta coded. It's all about change from the context around it. You have no absolute values of lightness or darkness. So we had done a lot of studies back some time ago seeing whether this kind of spectral change could actually undo the, the assimilation due to co-articulation. So here's an example with, um, sorry, this clicker is not my native clicker. <laughs> so I have too much experience with one in the opposite direction. Uh, but basically, experiments like this, Ada, Oda, Eba, Oba, and we know that it's precisely the same acoustic energy here following O is heard as is heard as da here and the same half syllable, same syllable is heard as ba following a. And we did a lot of experiments kind of of this sort. Uh, so this is the classic one, Alda, Arda, Alga, Arga, where all we would do is replace the third formant with nothing but a sine one, no speech. And we could fully recover the pattern of change of how you heard, in this case, da and ga. The pattern that we used to see for the context of all or R is the identical pattern is found when we do nothing other than introduce one frequency prominence where all or R should have ended. And we did a whole bunch of these. Um, so I can just tell you that spectral contrast undo, undoes the effects of the assimilative effects of co-articulation uh, because we did every kind of experiment you could, CVCs, VCCVs, VCVs, CVCs again, complementary backward spectra, that was pretty fun. We finally stopped doing this when Chris Darwin, great-grandson of Charles Darwin, wrote a lovely review of a paper of ours and said, of course this is really good, but can you guys stop doing it enough already? So we showed it all the ways that it could be shown. Uh, we also took it to a practical application. I'd be happy to talk with any of the engineers, but I have a pretty good idea how this is happening in your auditory periphery, both in auditory nerves and in a particular sub subset of fibers in the ventral cochlear nucleus called choppers. Um, but we were able to do this, and it actually does enhance spectral contrast between successive speech sounds. And in tests with normal hearing listeners with simulated hearing loss, just like Allard's, um, it actually increased recognition by 10% for males and 20% for females. The greatest improvement is where it should be, according to Miller and Nicely. The greatest improvement is for place. And it also improves uh, the performance of automatic speech recognition systems when used as a front end. All right, another thing about change. Does the auditory system calibrate over wider frequency ranges, over longer time spans? So in that case, what would I be predicting again is what are the redundant characteristics of the listening environment? That's old, that's no information, and what is new? These experiments are a lot like color constancy. Believe it or not, the light that comes up to your eyeballs from a particular color is vastly different depending upon the light source. All right, you guys all remember, what was it? Blue dress, gold dress, black, blue, that? <laughs> all right, the best explanation for that is people who saw that dress one way thought they were seeing it in daylight. People who saw it the other way thought they were seeing it under a regular tungsten lamp. That was the entire basis for an internet mania. All right, but that is you extracting your presumed spectrum of illumination. So we did an experiment just like that. This is with Michael Kiefta. We took advantage of the fact that Vowels E and U vary in two interesting ways. One interesting way is that E's have a relatively flat spectrum compared to U's, which have a relatively steep spectrum. But as we all typically think about, first formant for E, or second formant for E, is much higher than second formant for U. So we made a fully cross set of 
stimuli that varies both in what's the frequency of this second peak and what is this overall spectral tilt. Is it shallow and E-like or is it falling off a lot in, like in Ula? Is the uh, second formant low like it is in U or is the second formant high? And you see that listeners pretty much divide that space in a pretty sensible way using both tilt and F2. So we did two kinds of experiments. One is we took a speech precursor and we tilt and we filtered it with the same spectral tilt as they would hear in the volume. And when you do that, listen, listeners completely throw away tilt and use only F2. This is the one that I think is a little cooler. If I just have a pole, a frequency pole that runs all the way through that precursor and never changes, and it's at the same one for the target ball, listeners throw away your form, actually throw away the formant and do it only on the overall. <coughs> In other words, if it was a predictable characteristic of the listening environment, even though we all know, of course we use F2. No, you can actually make it go away. If it's become predictable and uninformative, you will just null it out. We've shown this a bunch of other times uh, with modulated, uh, non-speech modulated poles. My favorite was filtered music precursors like the Schubert String Quintet and C, a personal favorite. Changes your perception of tenor saxophone versus French horn. Filtered speech will change your perception of music. Filtered music can change the perception of balls. And we see that we actually adapt, adapt to those things and adapt to listening conditions. So right now, we're in a fairly anechoic space. If you went into, say, a restroom with tile walls, it'd be very different. And our auditory system automatically takes that away. Now, I want to spend the rest of this kind of moving up to get a little bit more interesting. Uh, but first, I want to convince you this really is something that auditory systems do. Um, these, and you don't have to get deep in the weeds, but these are measures of hundreds of neurons that are recorded. All right, some of them are being recorded in auditory cortex, way up here, and some of them are being, being recorded in inferior colliculus, which is about four synapses into your auditory system. And all they did, they played a bunch of bird calls to these neurons, and they asked, how much mutual information, how much is one guy doing that someone else is also doing? That's called mutual information. And one of the things that we see is that while you're in, in inferior cortex, the more neurons you record from, you can see an increase in mutual information. In other words, lots of them doing pretty much the same stuff. But by the time you get up here to auditory cortex, you see this big redundancy reduction in that the more you record, the more you find that they've specialized to all be doing different things. All right, so this idea of reducing redundancy as we ascend through the system. So in order to maximize sensitivity to change and increase information transmission, our system should become more sophisticated in absorbing reliable redundant characteristics with ascending processes. Now, thus far, I've been doing things like mean, variance, probability, density, what do these spectra look like? But probably, to me, the most exciting thing and the thing I've been working on for the last decade is where the best part of redundancy lives, and that's in second order statistics, things like covariance and correlation. And again, I wish I could say I thought of this, uh, but Horace Barlow, one of the most famous neurophysiologists uh, in the history of the field, had this idea of reduction of redundancy back in 1959. The idea that you're going to recode into a more economical, less redundant form, again, at Maven 54. So while these aren't ideas that we've been talking about a lot as speech people, in fact, I'm way late to the game. So we're doing a lot of work on how perceptual systems detect and exploit covariance in the environment, predictability, to enhance sensitivity to new information, things that are unpredictable, change. Uh, 
vision people, tip true to form, have also been a little ahead of us on this. Um, so the, lots of examples, I'll just show you two. Uh, this is some work on how do we detect, how do we detect edges in natural scenes. These are the actual natural scenes. And this is a great study by Bill Geisler. And it turns out that, sorry, we do it by detecting co-varying qualities and that's how we find our edges. And I could love to tell you the details of this paper if we had time. This is a really easy one to get your head around. Oh no, my graphics didn't come. These are supposed to be, do those look like two eyeballs to you? I, I promise you on the original, they were brilliant Google eyes. And this is only one eyeball. And what this is showing you is two cues to depth perception. So a monocular cue to depth perception, I can cover one eye and I look at this floor and the further it goes away from me, the more washed out it goes. It looks more like a low pass filter. By the way, same thing works for your ears. A lightning crack near, your, near you, crack. Lightning, thunder, or I should say thunder, two miles away from you, boom. Does that mean that that one didn't sound like a crack? No, by the time it got to you, all the high frequencies have been filtered out. Same thing with this monocular cue. Versus binocular disparity, you have two eyes. The image on one eye is slightly different from the other depending on how far something is away from you. In real life, those guys are pretty well correlated. And in the laboratory, where when we can do virtual vision, we can try to tease one apart from the other. And you know what? Your visual system will not use binocular disparity without texture gradient. It can't. It will not use texture gradient without binocular disparity. Because it has done a redundancy reducing operation to where those guys have collapsed onto a single dimension called depth. So this should work for speech, right? So changes across physical acoustic dimensions are seldom independent. Instead, they're structured to co-vary in ways that respect the physical laws that govern all sound producing sources. So for example, speech fans, articulatory maneuvers that produce consonant and vowel sounds give rise to multiple acoustic attributes that are constrained by vocal tracks. And my claim is that to the extent that perception is efficient, it should capitalize upon these patterns of covariance. This is a classic example where I only show 13 of the 16 different acoustic properties that contribute uh, the original from rapid and rapid. But the most interesting, so in addition to the fact that there are so many cues, no one of these guys will pull it off on his own. So Professor Youngman this morning really showed us how one, two, even just three it was miserable. But if you pull them together, you can get make some progress. So let me give you one example of a covariance in the auditory system. So this is our source filter model. Here, cut me off right here at the larynx, cut my head off. Here are the residents of the vocal tract at the output spectrum. What we know, in terms, this is just an example of lawfulness, is that Longer tubes, like men, typically, longer tubes have lower formants. Medium-sized tubes for women have medium-sized formants. And short tubes for children have higher formants. So here's this awful mess of all of these renditions of awe, spoken by men, women, and children. And this is the big Peterson and Barney problem of lots and lots of overlap. But what we see is that, in fact, in this particular example, the R value is a correlation of 0.81. Why does that R value have to be 0.81? Because it's physical acoustics. For every 10% lengthening of a tube, the resonances have to go down by 10%. No choice, no mystery. So this is what I see a vowel space looking for. All right, is that I don't see a vowel space of clouds. I see a vowel space where, for most of the vowels, most, they really do, the best way to capture them are by lines, by covariance, 
not by measures of central tendency. So, and by the way, a lot of this will be the topic tomorrow. Just a few more quick examples. We know that about the lack of invariance, but we also know from people, well, it began with uh, uh, Pierre Galatra and then the work of Harvey Sussman and his colleagues. In fact, things like place of articulation can be well captured by covariant structures. Aha, uh -huh, thank you. I'll move it. All right, I've been slow so far, right? <laughs> so, by the way, this is something new. In addition to there being uh, constant vowel locus loci, uh, with Michael Kiefta and I, we showed that it's also true for vowel consonants. And so this is, so this little breaking point, this is how most people in speech think about speech sound. All right? They think that there's this utterance, it spawns some ridiculous number of acoustic attributes, and somehow we bring them all back to this phonetic category. I don't think most speech people who do Q-weighting know it, but this is actually from a guy named Egon Brunswick. He called it a lens model back in 1956. I think it's wrong. Instead, one of the things that's true when you have a lot of things correlated with this hypothetical innate note, note for buck is those things tend to be well correlated with one another. I'm not the first to have thought of this. Eleanor Rush wrote about it beautifully in 1981 about children learning categories in their world. So I believe that phonemes if they exist, can be best described as redundancy across acoustic attributes. Now, I say I'm radical, but in fact, I am the stodgiest phonologist in the room right now. The reason is if we go back to Saussure, the sound of a word is not in itself important, but the phonetic contrasts which allow us to distinguish that word from any other. Jakobson, or Trubetskoy, 36, a theory of phonological oppositions. He didn't think that phonemes existed as things. He believed the whole system was one that ran on contrasts. And my very, very favorite, Jakobson and Holly, phonemes denote mere otherness. The way you should think about speech perception, this is the second time we get to see a 1955 Miller and Nicely, is speech perception is like a confusion maker. It's not what it is, it's what it's not. So at higher levels, perceptual systems become increasingly sophisticated at absorbing predictability, seizes on covariance across attributes that themselves are correlation structures. This is an interesting point, is that this actually requires the kind of hierarchical processing structure that our brains actually have because correlation at one point means at the next stage you have to expand the domain of space and time to make them work. Perception must be hierarchical. And the idea of categorical perception is driven by experience covariation. Now we've seen a few examples of using visual information. Well, the brain is opportunistic. Multimodal interactions are expected. So I'm being explicitly associationist. When non-auditory information is correlated with acoustics, it should contribute to efficiently coding, whether it's visual information or what your articulators are up to. And this is one of the very last points, but I think it's really important. When we go to this idea of information and change and how things are different, we have recharacterized what we're asking the neo-talker, the infant, to do. So when you want an infant to learn the sounds of their language, it's physically impossible for their vocal tract to create a sound like yours. What's totally possible for an infant is to create a difference between their two sounds that is very much like the adult model. So I think this gives us a lot of leverage in thinking about how infants learn. So with that, I'll conclude. Thank you very much. I do want to say that Fernando Llanos Lucas, now at University of Pittsburgh, and Christian Stilt have just been invaluable in developing all of this. So thank you very much.